Hello. Ooh, that's nice and loud. <clears throat> uh, everyone have a good lunch? Good. Hopefully no one will go to sleep. Since they had a good lunch, uh, I have really enjoyed the food here. If anybody here is from the campus, uh, you have my gratitude for the food here. It's been very good. Um, uh, would you please bow with me for a word of prayer as I start? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, you are too great to, to speak about. Uh, I am not worthy. I thank you, Lord, for the life that I've lived so far and the testimony that you've given me. And I pray, Lord, that it encourages others to share their testimony as well. Thank you, Father. Amen. I'm sure that doesn't come undone. Uh, so, if you weren't here for my messages Thursday and Friday, I'm going to recap a little bit. On Thursday, uh, we studied a verse in Leviticus that is, can be really hard to understand. Uh, there are some verses in scripture that when you read them, you're kind of like, what is this saying? It's hard to understand. And uh, I had read these verses multiple times and it didn't, what I was reading didn't fit with what I understood to be God's character. And so I knew it had to fit, but I couldn't figure out how it would fit. And so I would leave it and finally, just recently, it, uh, it clicked. And so we talked about that, and the lesson I think I want to just recap on that is that uh, God is love, his character is clearly displayed in scripture, and if we read things we don't understand, we have to keep that in mind. And even if it appears to not fit with God's character, it's not reason to throw the word out and say, I don't understand this, God isn't. It's, it's reason to pray and to study more and search more. So uh, yesterday I talked about the, the Good Samaritan. And God calls us all to be Good Samaritans. And we need to, Ellen White says that uh, without practical um, working on the behalf of others, then whatever we profess as our belief system, we are not Christian. And James 1.27 says that pure religion and undefiled before God is to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction and to be unspotted from the world. And so we are all called to look to others and try and find um, how we can help them and invest our lives in others. And today I want to share my testimony. I've teased it a little bit throughout the, the other s sessions, but I'm going to share the full thing today. And I'm going to start with my baptism. And I'm assuming everybody here is baptized. If you're not, that's awesome. Um, you'll probably get baptized someday. Uh, <laughs> I cannot remember when I was baptized. I was, it was, I was 14 or 15 or 16, I don't remember. Uh, it was not a special event. The only thing special about it was my dad baptized me, but that was it. That was the only thing special. As far as my walk with Christ and my conversion was non-existent. I checked the boxes and said yes to the questions that I was supposed to say yes to, and I knew the material, but as far as a relationship with Christ, there was nothing there. And so what should have been a very special changing, you know, baptism, we, are, we die and are reborn into newness of life with Christ, and that didn't happen. Because um, I did not die in here, in my heart. And so I got baptized and went back to my life. And when I was, so 15 or 16, uh, we were living in California, and we had moved to California because uh, probably seven years before that, my dad decided he was going to leave the ministry, he was a pastor, and we, he took his family and we moved to California. 
his first district when he became a pastor, they gave him arguably the most difficult district in North Dakota. Uh, he had three churches and one church was at war within it. There was a rift as wide as the Grand Canyon and so much political, if you, if you talk to one group, the other group would say you're betraying them and vice versa, and I'll never forget. I, I had to have been seven or eight, something like that, and I heard raised voices. We lived in this quadplex apartments, and we, we were renting two, the upper and lower ones, and our bedrooms were upstairs, and our living room and kitchen were in the downstairs one. And so I was up in bed, and I heard raised voices coming from the hall outside. It was an enclosed um, breezeway that you went in, because you can't have an open breezeway in North Dakota. <laughs> It'll fill up with snow. So uh, I heard voices, so I went out, and I'm on the upper landing, and I'm looking down to the front door, and there's a man from one of the churches there talking to my parents, and he's very agitated and upset, and, and he keeps saying, you're a mouse. You're a mouse. And I don't know what the conversation had been, but he was trying, apparently trying to convince my father to do something that he was not willing to do as far as the church went. And so because my father wasn't willing to do that, this man was calling him a coward for not being willing to do that. And uh, <laughs> the stress of that was getting very difficult on the family. And I got to the point where apparently I, I hated church. I'm like eight, seven or eight years old. One day, it was Sabbath, and my mom came in to wake us up to get ready for to go to church, go to Sabbath school, and I would not get out of bed, flat refused. I'm little, just absolutely would not get out of bed. I'm not going to church. Just and she couldn't do anything with me. I was absolutely um, unreasonable. So she finally goes and gets my father and says, you gotta go in there and do something. There's something wrong with that. He's, he's acting strange. And when my father came in and asked me what was going on, I said, I hate church. I hate it. I don't wanna ever go to church again. Church stole my father, stole my daddy from me. Uh, he worked all the time seven days a week. With three churches, they were two and a half hours apart from, there was, it was like in a row, and we lived kind of in the middle one, and then the other two were an hour each way. And he, so three prayer meetings a week, board meetings, visitations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, speaking twice on Sabbath, he was never there. And uh, I hated church. When I was even younger, I still, he was a cold, he started out as a literature evangelist when I was very young and moved from there. Uh, he became the publishing or the evangelism coordinator for the Dakota Conference and that led him into more speaking engagements and he felt called to preach and so that was, was what led him into pastor work. And as a literature evangelist, if any of you has had any experience with that, it is very hard work. He would leave before we got up in the morning, 6 a.m., whenever, 5.30, and then he would come home long after we went, had gone to bed. And so during the week, we never saw him, and oftentimes he was speaking on Sabbath. So in my younger years, he was not there and it was obviously negatively affecting our family and me and so he decided after that I think that outbreak where I refused to go to church was a big reason that he decided to leave the ministry and take his family we moved to California he got a job in uh, corporate business and he worked from home so from that point on, he was home all the time and available. Every Sunday, we went and played football with a church group, and we, he made a lot of money when he was in California. 
and we had a boat and we had a motor home and we had this and we had that and a pool and all these things and every weekend we were going out on the lake and skiing and wakeboarding and swimming and and always doing stuff but leaving the ministry he was still involved in church he was head elder and things like that but it it kind of allowed influences to come in to our family that probably wouldn't have come in had he stayed in the ministry. And I don't, that's not his fault necessarily. No, it's not his fault. <laughs> that just happens. That's just how, how things go. And uh, my dad always believed that I was special. I am special because I'm his son, but, but special in a different sense. When, when they became pregnant, before they knew it was going to be me, he had a dream, and in his dream, God told him that you, you will have a son, and you are to name him Thaddeus Joel. And he immediately, when he told my mom, and he told everybody in the church, or his friends and stuff, we're having a boy, and it was weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks before they could find out that it was, in fact, a boy. And everyone told him, no, you're going to have a girl, just watch, but here I am. And Thaddeus Joel means gift from God, chosen by God. Thaddeus is gift from God, Joel is chosen by God. And so he's always believed that I, I'm special in some way. I haven't ever believed that myself until maybe recently. Uh, I'll tell, say more about that in a bit. So after, so going back to high school, early high school, uh, after I'd been baptized and such, <clears throat> I became very involved in video games. I am an introvert. I like to be by myself and not so much a social person. And video games were something that, that I really gravitated towards, my personality. And so it he even, uh, my father, even as a, as a way to interact, would play them with me and such. And I'm, my personality, <laughs> as, as since I've been married for a couple years, my wife loves personalities. She, she studies people's personality inward and outward and upward and downward and backwards and forwards and sideways and inside and out and whatever dire other direction you can think of. And so she... She's out here in the, the pretty girl in the blue dress back there. And uh, so, so she's been analyzing my personality over these years as we've been married. And apparently I am more cleric than I thought I was. I'm also phlegmatic and melancholy. But the cleric is a more driven personality. They like to be the best. They, they, they're a little more perfectionist. But, and they tend to be leaders and such like that. Well, I can definitely attest to being the best because when I played a game, I had to finish it and finish it totally 100% and get the high score and all these things. And my friends didn't like to play with me because I was so good that they didn't have a chance. And about that time, online internet games were starting to become popular. Before that, the internet and computers just weren't powerful enough to handle internet gaming. You, you could play Tetris or chess or stuff online, but nothing um, three-dimensional and, and such. And <clears throat> this was the advent of broadband. Um, well, actually, you could play these on dial-up. Uh, broadband came a little later. But so I started playing those with my friends. And so we could, he could be in his house and I could be in my house and we could log in and get online and play together. It was really cool. And friends from other places and you make friends from all over the world who play these games and it's, it's fun. <clears throat> but it's very addicting. Uh, very, the games are designed like, um, what is it, Pavel, Pavel, Pavlov's dogs? Is that Pavlov? Yeah, Pavlov's dogs, um, reward. You do a certain action and you get a reward, and you do a certain action and you get a reward, 
And so it, it compels you to try and get that next reward and that next reward. And, and it's very hard to, to get one reward and stop. You're like, well, I'll just get that next one. And eight hours later, you're still, still at it, four o'clock in the morning. And we, the t particular game we were playing had a fantasy nature, elves and swords and all that kind of stuff, giants and magic, unfortunately. And there was one element of the game that if you died, you had to go and find your stuff and your stuff was often in a very bad place and it was very stressful because if you didn't get it in time, you'd lose all your stuff. So if you died, getting back to that was you, so hours, and sometimes it would take hours to get your stuff back. And you couldn't just quit and do it later because there was a timer and you had to get it after a certain amount of time. Um, as, so when, so as this is going on, I'm getting, I'm a, now, a, I just graduated from 10th grade, the school we went to, K through 10, and my sister would have been a freshman in high school. And my father felt called back to the ministry. We were older now and not as needing his um, interaction as closely and such. Uh, we, he was there, but he could, he could work, because we would be off at academy and stuff like that. So he decided to go back to the ministry and he was called back to the Dakota Conference. So he moved from California back to South Dakota. And my sister and I went to Academy in North Dakota, which was not really a positive experience for me, uh, sadly. But I don't, I don't think back on those years very positively. Continued. You couldn't really do much video gaming. Well, that's not true. We couldn't play video games online there, but we could have gaming systems in the rooms. And so I spent a lot of my time, my free time, in my room by myself playing games instead of out there socializing. Senior year, I dated a girl that it was a disaster, and it took me... I didn't date in my entire college, years of college, because of that relationship, because it was so traumatizing. Graduated and went to Union College to start. And there you could play online games, so I got back into the online games. A new game uh, that had just come out and uh, got really involved in that. Some things happened at Union. I was there for three semesters and I decided I wasn't going to stay any longer and I transferred up to Andrews. My best friend was at Andrews, my best friend from California, transferred up there and uh, took accounting. And we were supposed to room together. Well, he had a roommate, the first, it was in the middle of the year, so I had to room with someone else and then we were gonna room the next year. Well, I didn't know anybody and we, the next year we made it a semester and he, got expelled or something like that, or he left, he left. I don't know that he got expelled. I shouldn't say that because you could watch. I don't think he got expelled, but uh, he left. So now I'm by myself and I don't know anybody. And so the game, I got deeper and deeper. And these games, once you get really down, you're, you start teaming up with large groups of people to accomplish tasks. The, the difficulty goes up and up and up, and you can't do it by yourself, you need other people. So you join these groups and work together to accomplish tasks. And it becomes very competitive. There's different servers, which are essentially game worlds that you play on. And there's competition within those servers between the different groups to be the best on that server. And then there's competition between the best on each server with the best on all the other servers. And it can get quite competitive. And as my, 
as I got deeper and deeper into these things, um, I also played a lot of just console games, movies. I had a, quite a robust movie collection. Spent tons of money on these things. I'd buy a movie when it first came out because I'd, I'd gone to the theater and saw it. And then when it came out, I'd buy it. But since I'd already seen it, I'd never watch it. So it just got stuck in the, in the collection, but never really watched it. The game I was playing, it was called EverQuest 2. If you, all, if you care to look that up. I think it's no longer available. They don't play it. It's shut down. And I got to the point um, where I was in the best group on my server. And the, the character I was playing as, I was one of the top ten in the world at that specific character. And when you get to that level, it's like a job. You are required to be online seven days a week from, I think it was, 7 p.m. till whenever we were done doing the activities. And then there were other, they called them random events that could pop up at any time. And so everyone had everybody else's cell phone number. And so I would get a call during class or, or in the middle of the night or something, and they'd say, hey, this, this thing has happened. You need to get online. And so that, that's the, that's, that was my life. And I, at this point, church and God and all those things were way out there. Um, seven days a week, I'm obviously playing on Sabbath. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was kind of slavery. And I'd go to church just, just to kind of socialize. I didn't really go for whatever was being said. If I went to church, didn't go to really any of the other religious events. I, got as, I did enough worship credits to only reduce my fine to about half. And then I was like, whatever, I'll just pay the rest. So this is, we're about my junior... I w did five years of college, so I was a senior twice. So this is right around my junior, senior year, or something like that. And uh, as you can imagine, my grades were struggling because I was spending all my time playing video games. And video games, the science behind games, movies, any of these things, is they, your, your senses pick them up. So visually, they bypass your frontal lobe and go straight to the pituitary gland and other things that affect your, your sense of, of um, pleasure. So they, go, they, go, they bypass your frontal lobe and go straight into your pleasure center. And it, that's why it's a, it, it is actually very addictive. I've seen, there, there's more and more research coming out and recently I saw a brain scan that showed the comparison between a video gamer and a heroin addict, and their brain scans looked identical. So I was an addict at this point, without question. I was a 4.0 student. And I was a 4.0 in college long enough to the rest of the years where I was 2, 2.5, whatever, that I ended up with a 3.0, which was okay. Uh, good enough to, to kind of say, yeah, I, I, I made it. But I did. So junior, senior year, somewhere in there, was kind of everything. The, deeper and deeper you get there's somewhere subconsciously that, you know, I should be studying, I should be doing these things, but I'm not because I'm addicted and such, and so guilt and things, it starts to push you into a depression, and when you're depressed, you self-medicate, so go into the addiction more, which makes you feel guiltier and guiltier, which means you self-medicate more and more, and so on and so forth. So as so I was getting I was getting very depressed in college 
and because my grades were suffering and I knew I could do better, but I wasn't, that was causing it. And finally, uh, I failed a couple classes. And that was kind of the, the whoa moment. You know, this isn't me. I was starting to get a little bit um, bored or um, I wasn't enjoying the game anymore. It was becoming very repetitive. I wasn't getting any enjoyment out of what I was doing. And an opening came up in the best group in the world for my, the character type I was playing. So I decided I'm gonna see if I can make it with the best of the best. And however that plays out, when I'm done with that, I'm, I'm done. So I moved over there and, and joined them. And this is on call 24 seven, seven, you know, when I talk about, you know, you have to be on at such and such a time, it's even more. So you have to maintain like a 98%, they track. They track your attendance. And you had to maintain like a 98% attendance record to, to stay, or they would, they would kick you out and they were merciless because they were the best. You had to be, they were, everyone had to be the best. And so if you weren't, if you weren't pulling your weight, they were gonna find someone else who could. So it was very, it was very um, intense. And when I first joined them, a new expansion had come out which added some features to the game and we had to attain a certain rank within a week after it came out and I think the Lord was trying to stop me I wasn't listening so for three days the game came out on like a Thursday the internet at Andrews University went on on that Thursday just crashed and it was down for three and a half days. So I'm supposed, so I have a week, so from that day that it crashed, I had a week to, to reach this rank or I was gonna be kicked out. So now three and a half days are gone, I'm way behind. I, I probably played, when I finally got on, I probably, so three and a half days, what is that? 40, 84 hours, yeah, 84 hours. I bet I put 60 something hours in in those three and a half days to make it, and I made it. And then, because I'm a newbie, you're required to do the grunt work, so that meant those random events that happen, they're on a timer, and it's like they'll, they'll happen every 10, to 12 hours or, or in a week. So it's, they're on a week timer and it's within a, an, a six hour period that they would happen or so, something like that, 12 hours. So it was my job to wait for them to occur. And that meant staying up all night if necessary for that to happen. So I made it. I was in competition with another guy of, of my specific type and I, I, even though he had a three and a half day head start, he didn't stand a chance. I blew past him in a night, in a single night, and, and so I won the spot. They had one spot available. And then they required, so this is all, I'm, I'm trying, I'm reaching graduation. I've failed some classes. I'm now, um, facing more involvement in the game rather than less. And uh, so Thanksgiving break happened and they said, you need to be online at 9 p.m. on Sunday for a certain thing that they were doing. If you're not there, we're gonna kick you out. Because if I wasn't there, what a, the, it would set me way behind so I couldn't even participate in what they were doing and I'd be useless, so they would, they would just kick me out. That Sunday happened to be the day that, I, that we had to drive home from Thanksgiving break, and we lived in South Dakota, and this was at Andrews. So 11 hours plus the time change distance, and I had people with me, 
So to try to get back by 9 p.m., you had to, we would have to leave at, a, at, the, at, at least, at the latest, 8, and I'd just make it. So we're talking 7, 6 o'clock in the morning that we'd have to leave because you hit Chicago, which could be bad traffic. We, we spent one, one day, it, took a, it ended up taking us 17 hours because we spent four and a half hours in Chicago in traffic. So we left at like five o'clock in the morning. I talked to my sister, and I think she had a friend with her, if I recall correctly, into driving, getting up at 5.30 or something in the morning so that we could drive so I could make it back in time to do, to do this thing. Get back, I get up to my room, I set up my computer, and I was just about to turn it on, and I got the, str the it was, an impression, a voice in my head, however you want to call it, a question in my mind that said, is this really what you want to do with your life? And it was such a, obviously didn't come from my mind, it was such a strong question that I like froze, st my, staring at my blank computer screen. I couldn't answer the question, really. It's like, well, no, I guess not. This really isn't what I want to do with my life. And, and so I sat there in shock. I mean, it was, it was such a compelling question that, that cut clear to the core of whatever I was wrestling with internally that it, it froze me in my place. And I sat there for at least two hours. It was almost three hours, I think. And just, just frozen, just staring at my computer monitor, unable to go forward and not really sure what else I should do. And the time passed that I was supposed to be online by a long ways. So I went to bed and got up the next morning and logged in. And sure enough, they had kicked me out. So I was like, I'm done. That was, that was it. Now, that wasn't the end of my gaming. That still continued. But that was, that was like God, obviously God broke through somehow at that moment and changed the course of my life right there. From that point on, I, I, was, I was more able to experience his working, his Holy Spirit. I, I often wonder if maybe at that moment my parents were praying for me. Because we know that prayer is very powerful. And so someday I want to find out what happened there because something allowed the Holy Spirit to break through the darkness that I was enshrouded in and get, and get through to me at that moment. Graduated, went home, worked for my mom, still playing games, but I quit playing online games. And this kind of started me on the path to here, where I am today. And we look at the Christian walk. Uh, I li there's, a, there's a philosopher, a Christian philosopher, his name is, his name is Ravi Zacharias. He's uh, Indian and uh, not Adventist some questionable ethics as far as how his ministry is run, maybe. Uh, they get a lot of money to go and speak and stuff. But he said, he was talking about, someone asked him a question, can I live my life and do good and love others like Jesus taught and not have to believe in Jesus or worship God or anything like that? Just live a good life, basically, with, with the principles that Christ taught and still be okay. And so he answered the question this way. He says, the Christian walk is a sequence of events. It's a timeline and it always happens in this sequence. Repentance leads to redemption, leads to righteousness, leads to worship. And you cannot enjoy worship until you are redeemed and righteous. And I can look back and say this is absolutely true in my life because when I was young, been baptized but didn't care 
I wasn't redeemed yet. I did not enjoy worship. Worship was boring. I would rather, I was, like Jem was saying earlier, I was counting down the minutes to when Sabbath was over, and I loved it in the time of the year when Sabbath was over at like 5 o'clock, because you had all evening to do all kinds of stuff. That's what I enjoyed. Now, because, praise God, I am now redeemed, I love worship. I love the Sabbath. I love the, I wait for this time. And I think that for young people, any young people here, and parents of young people, this is something that's very important. We try to make, a lot of times, worship more attractive to young people or to ourselves, but that's the cart before the horse, because worship must come out of redemption and righteousness. And maybe if we focused more on, ma- on sharing, teaching our kids about Jesus and helping them to have a relationship with Christ, because that's what it's all about. The relationship with Christ is, is what starts everything. Without that relationship with Christ, you know, worship won't be enjoyable and everything. So it starts with Christ. And I think a lot of young people they're, they're raised with a knowledge, especially, in Adventist, especially Adventist young people, are raised with a lot of knowledge about Jesus, but no relationship. And somehow, I don't know how, I don't know the answer, but somehow we have to change that and teach them how to have a relationship. And that will lead to everything else. And they're, where, let's see, where did I hear? I think this statistic came out of Adventist Review it was something like 70, either two-thirds or 75% of Adventist young people who become baptized as a young teenager leave the church by the time they're in their early 20s. And I think that that, and the reason why, personally, because I've been there, I was baptized young, and I did leave the church by the time I was 21 in my, in my heart, without question. I still believed in God to some extent, but I, without question, didn't care about church. It's beca- and, and without question, the reason was is there was no relationship with Christ. And other things had come in to replace that. I had a relationship with something else. There are three, so there are three pillars of faith. Okay. The word, and I talked about, that was one of the pillars that I talked about on Thursday, is the word, that we can have faith in the gospel. Many youth leave the church because they don't trust the Bible. There's a lot of intellectual mumbo-jumbo going on that the Bible can't be trusted. It's written by men, it has contradictions, it's this, it's that. It, Daniel was written in, in 2nd century B.C. and all this crazy stuff. And so there there's no faith in this and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so if you toss out the word of God you cut the legs of faith out from under these kids Uh, another pillar is nature creation the Bible says that the things that are seen tell us I'm paraphrasing the things that are seen so nature what we see Tell us of the things that are not seen, which is God. We can't see God. We, we know the Holy Spirit is like the wind. We kind of see him rustling the leaves and stuff. We can't see God. So it's hard to believe in something we can't see. We like tactile um, reality. But the Bible says that, all, that the human body, the nature around us, testifies to that there is a God. And we know science, there's a counterfeit science with evolution that cuts that leg of faith out from under people. And the, sec- and the final one is experience. And for me personally, this is how I came back to God. I had that experience in my room when the Holy Spirit came through. After that point, I started having more experiences. I was tired of being depressed. I was fat because I was sitting in front of my computer for hours and hours and hours, 
um, eating junk food. I lived on Taco Bell and pizza, basically, and, uh, and soda and these things. And so I was fat. I, I was probably 220-something pounds. So from my height, that's 40 to 50 pounds overweight. And uh, depressed and stuff. So after college, I started to work on that. I, I, start, I took martial arts for six months, lost 40 pounds in six months. My job was fairly active. And uh, changed my diet. I, I went from eating two or th seconds or thirds to just one plate and two meals a day. Because they had taught us that and when I, I did cold porting for a summer and they taught us the two meals a day thing. So I understood that that, was, that worked for me pretty good. So when I was looking to lose a lot of weight, I went back to that. And then God started cutting things out of my life. You know, he had taken away the online gaming. He started to, to sour my taste towards the rest of the gaming. And uh, I started to feel impressed that I needed to go back to doing the things that I was taught I should do. Go to church, pay tithe. So I, just, I decided I was going to return tithe. I was in debt by this point significantly. I had tried to start my own business from one of those infomercial things that you see on early morning TV. And while it, w it would have actually worked, but I didn't try, and there's, it was a lot of upfront money, and so since I didn't try, I was stuck with all that. And I charged it on my credit cards instead of having the money to do it, which don't recommend, obviously. So now I'm in debt decided to return tithe. And because I was so far in debt, uh, I decided that I should go on a debt management program. These programs, because my creditors were calling me now, wanting because I was behind on my payments. So I went on a debt management program. So these programs, they take over your debt and get the creditors off your back and you pay one payment to them and then they spread it out to your creditors and help you pay off your debt. It's kind of in Dave Ramsey's method, they pay the smallest one first and then they move that into the second one and so on to get you out of debt. I had to call all my creditors to, uh, to get information that uh, they could send, that this company could, could send because they lower the interest rates and such like that. So I called one of my creditors where I had a $3,500 loan with and told them I need your information so that this company, that this debt management program can send you information uh, to enroll this debt in, in this program. And the guy says, well, okay, um, why don't we do this? Why don't we just cancel the debt? And just forget it ever happened. And you can imagine, I was like, you mean I don't have to pay this back? They're like, nope. <laughs> this debt was financed through the company that I tried to start the business with. So maybe they didn't want this debt management company getting information from them. I don't know. Uh, but he's like, yeah. You know, we don't, we don't do this bit. What he told me is we don't do this. We're not trying to put people out on the street because they don't do this business. That's not what we're about. We want to help you make money, but if it's not for you, then we're not going to saddle you, something like that. And he said, and I see you've been paying payments on this for a year or so. We'll refund you all the payments that you've been, been making so far. So $3,500. That doesn't happen. Um, as far as I know, to normal people, only that's a God. Only God does things like that. Then that was in 2008 or 2009, just after the economy had tanked. So it was even more amazing. <laughs> and <laughs> so confirmation: God blesses when you return tithe. My dad took a call to Kentucky about this time. Actually, he had to. This was after. We took a call. I was working at Fidelity Investments as a temp, making no money, hardly, um, in a job that I would never grow out of. They like to keep you as temps because they don't like to pay anybody benefits. So the chances of me getting hired full-time were almost zero. 
And I was starting to kind of like, well, God, what, what, I mean, I'm never, I'm not going anywhere in my life. This is going to take me nowhere. What do you want me to do? Started praying. I was up to this point. I had been living off my family, living at home. I was rooming with my sister. We had gone and got an apartment, but I had so many bills that I couldn't even help with rent. So she was paying for the apartment and just letting me live there because she didn't want to live by herself. And so I was tired of living off of other people. So I felt like I needed to go out and get on my own and started praying. And I felt impressed to go back to school. Now you have to understand that I hated school. I hated high school, I hated college. These were bad times in my life. And I had sworn that I was never going back to school. And then here is this impression, you should go back to school. So I was like, okay. So I had been, so right when this was happening, I started looking into that. I had to do some crazy things. I had to pass a standardized test because my grades were so low to get into the grad program at Southern. And they require a certain amount of points. And I made it by like three points because I had to score pretty high because my grades were so low. So God got me over that hurdle. But then as I'm, I'm keeping going, as I'm kind of going that direction, a position opens up on my team, on my team that in, at Fidelity, something that I had been waiting for all this time, the position opened up. And everybody on the team expected me to apply for that position. So I was working at Fidelity Investments and as a temp. And so occasionally people quit or whatever and positions open up and you can become a full-time employee. But there were people there who were temps for six or eight years. So they tended to get those positions. But it was on my team, so I had a good reputation. So, so I had this decision to make. I could, I, f I had felt that God was calling me to go back to school, but then here's this awesome blessing of, of this position opening up that I had been waiting for. Which one was God? And I'll never forget, I, I had been encouraged by the management to apply for it. I hadn't told them about my plans to maybe go back to school. And they were expecting me to apply for it. I'll never forget, I was at my desk and I filled out the application and I was about to send it and I got the most, my like gut-wrenching feeling, like don't push the button. <laughs> you know, don't push the button. Um, and that happened two different times where I was like, well, maybe I'll just apply for it. But I just had this just deep feeling in my gut, don't do it. That's not what I want you to do. So I, I didn't apply, and they were shocked. And then I told them I was leaving to go. I'd been accepted by this point at Southern. And I believe that I was not so attached to Christ that the devil couldn't influence my life. And I believe that, the, that in order to derail me from whatever plan God had for me from going to school, the enemy opened a door over here to try and get me to go another direction. And that's what I believe. Uh, sometimes I think God there's, old, there's multiple doors and you have to test them and stuff, but I kind of feel like that was, because had I stayed at that job, I, my life would have not really gone anywhere. Coming, coming to Southern was an amazing experience. And I, by the time I graduated from Southern, I was free of video games completely. I had sold all my systems, all my, 90% of my movies by this time, and God was really starting to teach me things that I needed to do for whatever work. And I was starting to believe by this point that maybe God does have something special for me, and my dad was right in the beginning. 
and maybe I should see what that plan that God had for me at the very beginning when he gave my dad a dream, what that is. I don't know what that is yet. I, and so every, since coming to Southern, every job I've had has taught me something new, new character development, new skills, new, I feel like each thing has been preparation for something later down the road. And I, I shared how I came to Jesus for Asia. Same kind of impression thing of when I was sitting in front of my computer, just a very clear, and so that's, that's how I'm here speaking to you. Um, I feel very strongly that God led me here. And I believe that God led me to Southern so that I would meet my wife. That's where I met her. And had I not come to Southern, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to not only meet her, but I'd have never met Jesus for Asia, and I would not be standing here right now. So I look back and I can see this sequence of, of events that happen where God was leading me down a path. So a few closing thoughts. I want to go to Matthew chapter 6. So I've been talking about you know, God's plan for my life. And in the year or so that I've been here at Jesus for Asia... God has really opened my eyes to, you know, you see the map, all that red on the map, all the, all the needs out there, um, the state of the gospel and things like that that I would have never realized otherwise. And shortly after coming to Jesus for Asia, I was kind of randomly studying my Bible, and I was studying Matthew chapter 6 and verses... 19 through 21. And that says, Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupt, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I had heard these verses dozens of times, probably, in my life. But... At this point, because of what I had learned of the three plus billion people who have had no experience with Jesus, uh, 6,000 languages yet to go that have no Adventist presence in them, um, all, you know, 20,000 kids die every day from hunger and who's, who's, who's reaching them, all these kind of things. When I, when I read this, I suddenly understood what this was really talking about. That um, we think about treasure as being some kind of you know, money or what, what is the treasure that we lay up in heaven is the question. And I had never really understood what that treasure was. Um, merit or, or you know, good, good behavior or something. Something that we're doing down here that helps us get into heaven. You know, you reach a certain treasure amount in heaven and you're there kind of thing. But what I realized was that the treasure in heaven is the people on earth. Because Christ views us as so valuable. Each one of you is infinitely valuable in the eyes of heaven. And so if if we are so valuable that Christ would lay down his life for us, from the foundation of the world, Jim or Gail, I can't remember which, who said that, that the plan of salvation came into existence as they were creating the earth. Like, Jesus had decided, yes, I am going to die for these people, and then they created the earth, knowing that he was going to die for them. They, they, because they know. They know the beginning from the end. And so these verses really spoke to me. The treasure. You are treasure. And there's people that we can each reach, and they are our treasure in heaven. And so the Bible says, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Well, how do you lay up for yourselves people in heaven? You have to go and reach them interact with them, invest your lives. The, the whole basis of Christianity 
is to destroy our self, our reliance on ourselves, and to make us rely on Christ. We have this war between the flesh and the spirit, and that's the whole purpose of Christianity is to reduce us to nothing so that we can rely on Christ, so that he can then use us to reach the people that he died for. And there's a beautiful statement in Ellen White, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to read this every time I preach, I think. Desire of Ages, page 641. When we love the world as Christ has loved it, then his mission for us is accomplished, and we are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. And this is the goal when Paul talks about the race that we must run. That's the goal. God is trying to turn all of us into him, to live in us. He wants to be in us, and he wants to shine his love that he came and died for the people of the world through us to other people so that they can be saved. And so our goal is to love the world as he did. And I had to ask myself, this is within the, I've started asking myself, do I really love, do I really love you? Can I say that? Asking myself, do I really love every person in my church? Do I even love my family like I should? My wife like I should? All these things. Uh, and, and asking God, Lord, I want your love for the world. Help me to love others as you love them. And it has really opened my eyes to suffering in my own church and things like that. And uh, so that's what I want to leave you with. The treasure in heaven is people. And the only way, the main way you reach people is by loving them. And the only way we can truly love is by having Christ in our hearts. Because that's because only because love comes from Christ. God is love, and so I'm I'm going to challenge you every single time I get up here to go out and tr and challenge yourself to ask God, how can I love the people around me more? How can I invest my life in them? Because Christ invested His whole being in us. How much? Why? how much less should we invest our whole being in our brothers and sisters on earth? Uh, <clears throat> instead of prayer, <laughs> instead of prayer, we're going to sing a song.